Hey there, this is Dr. Evan Osar with the Institute for Integrative Health and Fitness Education. And welcome to this edition of Integrative Movement Insider. In this week's edition, Facebook Live here, I'm going to discuss that whole concept of whether the knees should go past the toes when you're doing exercises like deadlifts, squats, lunges, and things like that. And why it's important to understand functional anatomy, because Understanding functional anatomy, and I'll add to that biomechanics, how joints function, as well as motor control, helps you understand some of the myths that are out there versus some of the realities. and helps you understand why you do the certain assessments that you do, what information you take from those assessments, and ultimately, that will help you direct what your correct exercise strategy will be. So today, I should say Thursday, today's Monday, happy Monday, Thursday will be day, day two of our Integrative Movement System Foundations program. It's a three-day, completely virtual course. There's still time to join in. If you want more information about the program, just reach out to helpdesk, one word, at fitnesseducationseminars.com for more information if you're still looking to enroll in that program. Because in that program, we teach you the functional anatomy so that you understand how the joints work specifically and how the nervous system controls the myofascial system around the particular joint we're discussing. And in this week's module, we're talking about the hip complex as well as the shoulder complex. Now, hip complex obviously is very important to what happens down at the knee. Now, when we think about what the knee should do during functional activities like squatting, like lunging, like stepping, we need the knees to move and progress over the toes to properly load the foot. And what I mean by load the foot is to align and control the foot. We need the foot to essentially do three things. I should say two things and then an additional component of those two things. Number one is when we're loading the foot, we need the foot to go slightly longer and wider. And then the third thing is we need the arches to slowly lower. Now, what we've often been taught in the industry is to, when we squat, is to move our, have our clients push their hips back. The first motion to be push those hips back. And if you do this with me, so as you're watching this, do this with me. Get into your best squat position. And now, first motion, push your hips back and then come back, okay? Do that one more time. Push your hips back and then come back. And then I'll do it one more time and feel the weight underneath your feet. So push back. And where does the weight go on your feet as you push your hips back? It goes to your heels. And if you actually watch me here, as I push my hips back to do a squat this way, it actually takes me off the ability to get my big toes down on the floor, which is what the function of the knee is, is to help to load the foot, to elongate it, to widen it, and to allow those arches to drop so that the foot reacts to the ground. Now, when you squat this way by pushing the hips back, you see exactly what happens. You, my feet roll to the outside, my big toes come off the ground. That's not an optimal way to load the foot, and it actually is not an optimal way to load the hips either. Because what should really happen is when we load the hips, when we do a squat, for example, the first motion should be anterior pelvic rotation. It should be the rotation of the pelvis and the whole cylinder anteriorly. And now watch what happens to my feet when I do that. As I answer, I rotate the cylinder, the weight comes over my feet, my big toes stay down, and my foot can get longer, wider, and spread out those arches slightly lower. From the side, the very first motion is not just this, it's not anterior pelvic rotation like this. You do that if you're a selfie model, you, you want to take a good photo for the, for the internet, for Instagram. But if you want to teach the individual how to load their posterior hip complex, so the glutes, external hip rotators, and hamstrings, you need to teach your client how to rotate the entire cylinder over top the femoral heads. That's the axis of rotation for a squat. So that way the knees can go over the toes relatively, or towards the toes, I should say. Should be way out here like that. But they should go towards the toes to load the feet appropriately. And this will also load that posterior hip complex. Because a lot of our clients that have knee pain have been taught to do this when they squat, which takes away knee pain per se, but it actually increases pressure on the low back. Because if you take the pressure off the knees and you put it and you shove your hips back, well now you're overloading the low back because that's not how you should be loading during a squat, whether it be a bodyweight squat or externally load, loaded squat pattern. Now, one of the things we often see, especially when our clients do this, one of the things that 
one of the muscles, I should say, that's short and tight, not the only one, is the lateral hamstring. Now, biceps femoris. Biceps femoris comes from the initial tuberosity. It actually blends into the sacral tuberous ligament, which is kind of right here. This is probably an awesome scene for me poking my butt <laughs> online. But then it comes laterally and attaches down into the fibular head. So what it does is it helps to pull the knee out, relatively externally rotate that hip. However, if it's short and tight, which it frequently is in many of our clients, it will do one of two things. It will rotate your pelvis opposite. So my left biceps femoris is a little short, so it will rotate my pelvis to my right side. Because when it's short, it's bringing the, argin, the attachments, the arginine insertions closer together, and it will create rotation to the opposite direction. So my left short biceps femoris will rotate me that direction. But what that will also do to me is as I rotate, you see what happens to my knee. It also rotates my knee in. Now, a lot of people say, oh, that's valid, you just need to teach the client to push your knees out. But again, if you watch, if I just push my knee out, I'm gonna go to the outside of my foot. The same as that thing that pushing the hips back did. This is why it's so important to understand functional anatomy and why it's super important to understand what should happen during normal mechanics, what's normal alignment, and what should happen when you start to load that lower extremity in this case. So, oftentimes we need to release the biceps femurs. And this is why we teach so much functional anatomy in our two anatomy geek series. We actually have the knee series coming out next Monday. And also why we go over functional anatomy and biomechanics in the integrative movement system, the foundations course, so that we will understand what you're looking for with your assessments, why we teach things that the way we do, and then ultimately why it drives our corrective exercise strategy. So the first part of the integrative movement system, corrective exercise strategy for common knee issues like chondral malation patella or wearing weight on the the kneecap for this valgus knee position that's causing meniscus issues and overstretching that medial collateral ligament of the knee, the first thing we do is we do our release. So we assess, and then that drives the information from our assessments drive our corrective exercise strategy. So we'll oftentimes have to release that biceps femoris. Now generally we'll do that on the floor with a, a myofascial release tool like the Rolda. Rolda is actually our favorite myofascial release tool. Guys over at Rolga have done a great job creating and marketing this Rolga. We carry this in our office. I make no money by telling you that we use Rolga. We just carry it in our office because we found it super effective for ourselves. We always use it on ourselves first. And we only recommend products that we like ourselves and we found success with our everyday clients. Our clients love us as well. It's a great way to release that biceps remorse just by leaning on the outside. But some of our older clients, many of our older clients, can't get down to the floor and or do this release well. So this is how we would do it in a seated position. So you could use a bench, you can even use a chair. What we'll do is we'll sit in the chair, we'll put the lateral hamstring on one of the zones. So this is zone one of the roll gut. Here's two, these, these two groups here are three, and then this pump on the outside is zone four. I'm gonna put my lateral, my, ham, my lateral hamstring, the biceps femoris, right on this group here. So what I'm gonna do is basically just align it on that groove, make sure my pelvis is square that direction, the opposite leg is out to the side. And what I'll do is do a very light contract relax. I'll push my heel, gently activate that biceps femoris, really trying to align my pelvis, my femur, and my tibia. I'll contract for a count of five, four, three, two, one, and then lengthen out. So I'm gonna lengthen out, I can hold this so it doesn't roll out, and just hold that without going to posterior tilt. Stay up on the issue of tuberosity, so make sure that you're training the hamstring to lengthen in the position you want. Because a lot of our clients are just stretching like this and hoping that that creates hamstring length, but it's not. It's really just stretching their low back. So stay up on the issue of tuberosity, lengthen, and we would do that for three to five times. Okay, contract, so shorten it for count of five, four, three, two, one, lengthen, hold that up there, generally hold it up there for about 30 seconds, so that's usually about three to five breaths. Trying to actively extend the knee and dorsiflex the ankle, however, staying as neutral as I can and not going into this posterior tilt position, staying up on top of the issue of tuberosity so that I get the length here where I need it, not here where I don't need it. And then we'll do that three to five times, okay? So that's the myofascial release. Now, once you've done a release, you have to teach your client how to activate it, meaning how to use it in a functional position. 
because it's great that you just lengthen it. But if you haven't taught the nervous system how to use it in a more lengthened position, the nervous system is slowly going to, going to say, hey, I don't feel so great here. You took away that tightness, so that feels awesome, but now I don't know what to do with it. So now I'm just going to tighten that right back down. And oftentimes it'll get tighter after your hours later. That's why clients will say, oh, I feel good when I'm not actually releasing, but later on I feel tight or, and or tighter all over again. So you can teach the client how to use it. And this is why we love the hip hinge and especially the split stance hip hinge because this teaches your client how to align that lower extremity and also teaches them how to functionally lengthen it in the upright position, which is where it actually needs to lengthen. Not when you're laying down on the floor, not when you're wrapping a cord around it, but when it's actually in the upright position. This is great too for your clients that have problems with squatting and actually knee pain because we can still train the posterior chain and we need to without overloading the knee. So again, it starts with the alignment of the head, neck, and thoracal pelvic cylinder, hands on the pelvis. So from here, stepping back and then maintaining the weight primarily on that forward leg. And the first motion is not pushing the hips back. It's rotating the pelvis anteriorly. So that way, I mean, I'm staying square to that forward leg. And that's really the key. Because everybody, most people, lots of people are doing that hip hinge pattern. Most people are not doing it well, especially the split stance. Because here's what happens. Sorry about my behind in your face. So what's happening to a lot of our clients is they're doing this right here. They're going right into the rotation and they're bringing their knee directly into that valgus position. And they're like, oh yeah, I feel, I feel back here. But they're just reinforcing that non-optimal alignment. So it's a line, head and neck, thoracic pelvic cylinder. Square the pelvis to the forward leg. Step back, staying square. Weight primarily on the forward leg. And then it's the hinge position here. So that the line on the pelvis on the shorts should stay level the entire time. Foot tripod should remain, hip, knee, ankle, foot should remain aligned. And then you start to get that loading in the posterior hip. And if your client does not feel it here, they feel it in their knee or their low back, they're not aligned, they're not rotating anteriorly through their, around the hip joint. So the rotation comes around the hip joint. It's not by pushing back, it's rotating around. In fact, you should almost feel like you're leaning forward so that way the weight stays over top of the foot and also you get that eccentric lengthening you need through that posterior chain so that you get the length and you also reinforce the alignment and control you need for upright positions like, basically if you think about this position here, this becomes the end phase of your lunge or your reverse lunge. It's all the same position. If you look at my shorts here, it's the same position here. Or if you're doing a forward lunge here, it's basically exactly what we just trained to maintain that alignment of the hip, knee, ankle, and foot, and maintain that pelvis level and to load that posterior hip complex. So a great way to go from your assessment to your corrective exercise to your integration into a lunge or a reverse lunge pattern to teach your client how to use that length you just created in the hamstring to create those new habits that they can ultimately take into the fundamental movement patterns and then progress them towards accomplishing their health and fitness goals. This is Dr. Abby Nosa. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it made sense. And if you're really looking for more information about functional anatomy, then join us for True Anatomy Geek starting next Monday. It's the next four Mondays. So Monday, I believe it's the 16th. And the next four Mondays, we're going over the knee complex and how the muscles of the knee or the, how the brain controls the muscles around the knee to provide stability, shock absorption, and all the functional patterns that we need for the lower extremity, and why non-optimal alignment and control lead directly into some of those common knee issues like osteoarthritis, like chondromalacia patella, like overloading the patellar tendon, and some of those chronic hamstring issues like tight hamstrings and chronic hamstring spasms and things like that. And if you're looking for that more in-depth how to use your functional anatomy knowledge, how to use this information to make significant changes in your clients. And this is the same information I used with Janice's nephew, Addison. He, he, was, he actually had Ajwin Slaughter's, which is, an, old, which is a, an increased growth, right? To be able from an injury, from a basketball injury. Well, after that, he developed an injury to his Achilles tendon where they wanted to do surgery. And it was because no one, even through all the rehab he did, no one taught him how to better align his thoracic pelvic cylinder. No one told him how to, taught him how to get his foot tripod. No one taught him actually how to hinge well. Well, today, 
about two years later, you went through this exact same process. I took him to integrate a movement system. I made sure he earned the right by getting through the right progressions. Today, he's a stud athlete, soccer player. And, he, and it was cool, his mother, Kristen, said to me, she's like, when he first came back, his first game back, she sent me a picture. She's like, it's incredible. He's, he looks more solid, more balanced, stronger than all the other athletes on the team. And that was a year of not playing soccer, just going through this process because I helped him earn the right. And again, people think, oh, you got to train sports specific. And I'm like, well, yeah, you do at some point, but not in lieu of teaching people the fundamentals. And that's the beauty of the integrated movement system and why and how you can become a specialist and help more individuals that have been looked over, people that just aren't getting better, people that are struggling, whether they had joint replacements or need joint replacements, this information can really change people's lives. Addison was going to have surgery if he didn't change his strategy. He was able to avoid surgery and get back to playing the sport that he loves and actually come back stronger than he was before. When you understand functional anatomy, biomechanics, motor control, you have the tools, you have the strategy, you have the education, the knowledge, the understanding of how to apply the information, and that's the beauty of integrated movement system. What we share with you in, in Two Anatomy Geeks, again, four modules, that's a super quick, easy way, a fun way. Jill makes it super fun to learn anatomy, and if you're looking for a more intense integrated movement system, the foundation course is going on right now, it's not too late to join that, and then again, obviously, the year-long intensive integrated movement specialist certification program. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for all you do for your clients. If you have any questions about anything we discussed here today, besides what's wrong with me, what can I do? As long as it applies to your clients, please reach out and ask. Happy to help you. And thank you for all you do for your clients and making this world a better place. This is Dr. Evan Osar with the Integrative Movement Institute. Make a great day. We'll see you next time. And for those of you that are part of the Integrative Movement Specialist Certification Program, we'll see you on Thursday. Take care.